I don't know what else you can be, a Christmas angel. I don't know who you are. It's always in order for us to celebrate Jesus. And so if you, if you look at the Christmas season and what it really is all about and should be all about is celebrating him. You know, the angels celebrated him. The shepherds celebrated him. Wise men came from afar to celebrate him. How about we just celebrate Jesus this morning as well? Why don't you lift your hand where you are and just tell the Lord, Lord, I welcome you into this place this morning. Lord, we thank you for what it is that you have in store. There are things, Lord, that have, have arrived in this place. There are situations and circumstances. There's problems. There's, there, there's hurt. There's pain. There's so many things that are represented in this room today. But, Lord, we know that you are here. And because, Lord, you are here, anything is possible. Anything is possible, and we trust, Lord, your will to be done. We trust, Lord, that your word would go forth, and, Lord, that your spirit would have preeminence over everything that we've come here for. We've come here to worship the Lord, and so we are going to do that. We thank you, Lord, for your help today. In Jesus' name, God bless you this morning. Let's worship together. You may be seated.
Now, we, we take offerings, and for most of you who um, have been here for a while, you kind of have picked up on our regular offering routine, which is first Sunday of the month, we give the global missions to our global missionaries and all the works that are being done around the world. The second, uh, second week of the month, the second Sunday, we always give to North American missions, which are local uh, works that are new churches that are being started here in the United States and in North America. So that's Canada, North America, Mexico, um, or United States and Mexico. So one of the uh, one of the places that we support is Pastor Terry Etherton uh, in St. Clair, Missouri. And so he sent us this real lovely Christmas card. It said, the Pentecostal Church, thank you for giving uh, to us and our North American missions. Our North American missions work, work here in St. Clair has been richly blessed by your sacrifice, but most importantly, by lifting us, uh, us up in prayer. We, we pray for you all and are, trust, are truly blessed from our all. Our, our almighty, I can't even read today, our almighty God this holiday and all year long. Thank you so much for your giving. And so I just want to th say thank you on his behalf to you for your giving to uh, North American Missions. I have a few announcements here I want to give to you. Number one, uh, first Tuesday prayer this week, uh, Tuesday from 7 to 8, we're going to be here. We're looking, oh, and our offering. How about that? Why don't you come on up, ushers? All right, so this is this is something I, I'm I'm going to be shooting from the hip here. It seems like all right, I already got my guns out. All right, we're we're uh, one of my things was this. All right, we 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 get in these ruts, and we we get stuck in these ruts, and then you got to kind of break the routine up. So one of the things was this. I was like, how about we have the ushers come, and then we'll do the offering. Or we'll do the offering first. Then we'll take the We'll give the announcements while the offering's going on. So we're kind of killing two birds with one stone and this kind of thing. And so every time I get up here, I do the announcements. And then I do the offering. So let's just pray over this offering. God, help us today. We need your help today. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing upon our missionaries. We're praying, Lord, for our global missionaries today, that you would, Lord, bless them where they are. Lord, you know the, the areas in which they have been given and called to give influence. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them influence with the governmental systems, Lord, that you would give them platforms in which they can preach and speak to the, the lost and the dying in their areas. Lord, I pray, God, over their spiritual jurisdictions. I ask, Lord, that your blessing today would be a blessing to them. Multiply it and use it according to your purpose in Jesus' name. Now... As you are giving, I'll continue with my announcements. Seven to eight, we are going to be here a Tuesday praying, and we invite you to come and join us in prayer this Tuesday. Also, our quarterly fast. We do a fast every quarter uh, throughout the year, and so our quarterly fast is going to be Wednesday the 13th uh, through Friday the 15th. Now, the church is going to be open from five to eight for those who want to come in and just kind of end your time in prayer. We're going to have the church open for you. You can come and just spend time with the Lord here at the church. I believe it's important for you to connect your prayer time with the house of God. I believe it's important for you to, if you can, I know not everybody can do that. Uh, you, I don't know what your day is going to look like on that Friday, but if it is at all possible for you to take time on that Friday between five, the hours of five and eight to come here to the church, just to step in the door and spend some time with the Lord and thank him and kind of close up that time of prayer and fasting in here in the house of God, I would really encourage you to do so. Uh, crew, our Christians reaching everywhere, that's our youth group, have a Christmas party at the Morgan's house on Saturday the 16th. Is that at 5.30, Jamie? And if you have any other details, you can talk to Sister Jamie Morgan's about that. Uh, in conjunction with the crew Christmas party, Sister Chris, Chris Grimshaw is um, volunteering to host a craft and game event over at the Annex on that same time frame at 5 o'clock, 5.30 uh, for, for second through fifth grade. And that's going to be also at the same time frame. That's going to be wonderful. For those of you that have kids that are in the crew, but you also have younger ones, you can bring them there and it'll be a great time. Also, everybody say church Christmas dinner. Church Christmas dinner. I have to have you say that because some of you will look at me like you're, you're in a days or something so i just want to make sure everybody's awake everybody's alive christmas dinner 
Um, on Wednesday night, the 20th, at the Lodge at Rothwell Park, it'll be at 6 o'clock, um, and you can just bring a side dish. It's going to be a carry-in, so the church will provide all the dinnerware, cups, ice, we'll provide tea, and uh, maybe some lemonade with water, and then also we will provide a uh, entree meat, so that'll either be turkey and ham or something of that combination. You just bring all the other fixings that you can uh, bring to, and bring some to share, please. Bring some to share, and we'll have that dinner on the 20th at the Lodge in Rothwell Park. Amen? Amen. All right, let it be. All right, let's stand together. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. There's a lot of us that have been dealing with a lot of sinus trouble and different things that are ha going around. Sister Billy Bennington is not uh, feeling so well today. Ed, as well, not feeling very well this morning, um, and we want to pray for them. Those are the only two that I have on my list, but if you have need in your body that you would like the Lord to touch you, uh, I'm going to invite you to come uh, while we pray for Billy and Ed and the Bennington family. You can step forward, and we got people who will meet you here at the altar, and we'll pray the prayer of faith and believe God for you. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray together right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for giving us, Lord, healing in our bodies according to your word. Lord, we can call upon your name in faith believing. Lord, your word says that by your stripes we have healing. We can claim that healing. We can boldly go through the throne of grace. And, Lord, that's what we do today for Ed and Billy Bennington, that you would just allow your healing virtue to minister to them today. Lord, right there at their home, Lord, that you would minister to them and allow, Lord, the peace, Lord, to come to their body. Lord, that they would feel, Lord, your strength coming in and minister to them today. I pray, Lord, over all that are sick in body this morning, maybe those that are watching, Lord, today on Facebook, that they would feel your glory come into their situation. Lord, that your healing is available. It is readily available. And all we have to do is in faith call upon your name. We call upon the name of Jesus because, Lord, there's healing in your name. Lord, we thank you for the deliverance and the power and the authority that comes whenever we call upon your name. We're so grateful, God, to be your chosen people. Lord, to be a part of the body of Christ. Lord, that we can share our needs with one another. And Lord, that we can make our petitions known. And Lord, that I have brothers and sisters in Christ that'll, that'll have faith for me, that'll lift up my need before your throne. I thank you, God, for the body of Christ and what it represents here today. I thank you for ministering to each and every need that is represented in this room. Lord, whether it be a physical need, a spiritual need, an emotional need, whatever type of need, Lord, I thank you that, thank you that every need would be supplied, every need met. We trust, Lord, your will. We trust, Lord, what your word promises to us. And we commit it, Lord, into your love, your mercy, your wisdom, your power, and into your great authority. And we thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. God bless you this morning. You may be seated. We're going to worship the Lord. How many is going to worship the Lord together? The Lord. Amen. Let's give God what he is due. doing a Christmas song or something that has to do, but it's, it, this is not a performance. This isn't us saying, oh, look, we're celebrating Christmas, but this is a time for us to worship together. This song is called God With Us, and it talks about the sacrifice that he made for us. He's wonderful. He's a counselor. He's everything we need, and he came through the avenue of a little baby, and I'm so thankful for his mercy and his grace, and I'm thankful that the promise is here and that the sacrifice is made so that we can stand here and worship and celebrate what we're celebrating. Thank you, Jesus. Waiting, desperately The day when all is revealed, promise spoken by angels, Savior from 
ever-living God is with us this morning right in the house. Thank you, Jesus. Behold, Jehovah, seated on the throne.
and it's Jesus. Woo! Victory has a name, and it's Jesus. Oh, the word has a name, and it's Jesus. Redemption has a name.
Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Can you lift up a hand right now? I'll begin to worship the Lord for who he is. Why don't you lift up a shout of praise right now? Because we know that he is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who reigns in victory. Hallelujah. We can shout with a voice of triumph because we know our God has already been to the end. He's from the beginning and he's already won because he is the reigning champion. Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. TPC, lift up a voice of praise right now.
message. He's about to crack open the book. Literally, it's going to change something in your spirit in the direction of your life. If you will take the next five minutes, I don't know, unless you get a little apostolic on this, you may take ten. And you will open yourself up to what the Lord's about to do through his word. Begin to prepare your spirit right now with a shout of praise. The Israelites had to shout first before the walls began to come down. The Lord asked them to take a step of faith and do something. So you may feel a little in bondage. You may feel like a few walls are around you right now. <laughs> but that's when the shout comes. That's where it comes into play. It's before the walls begin to fall. You're going to shout. Your walls are beginning to fall. I'm prophesying to you in the spirit because that's the, what the word promises. And then pastor is going to preach to you. And the new ground of your heart is going to receive that word. That's the way it works. We do the praise. We do the work. The word begins to fall on good ears, good ground. And at the end of this altar, when you're ready to come up, something is going to have already sprouted your spirit. Ha-ha. Woo! And a breakthrough is about to happen. This is the work. Are you ready? I'm in to go for it. ha da 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 Triumphant in battle, we are victorious. God is most high over Here all the earth. Jesus has conquered. Shout of praise. He is worthy. Hallelujah, Jesus. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To the one who was and is and is to come, who's been faithful, who's been just, who's been true, who has provided, who has made a way where there was no way before, who has become my peace speaker, my way maker. We celebrate you, Jesus. We celebrate you, Jesus. Oh, come on, somebody. Let's just worship him for a minute. Hallelujah.
I don't know about you, but he has truly been good. God has been so good. He's been just what we've been singing about, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh. Anybody know him to be a provider? My wife and I take on, you know this about me, with the construction aspect, I'll, I'll try to remodel a house usually once a year or something if we can. And this last year we bought this small little bungalow on South Morley and, and uh, just whatever time I had I would spend there. And, and it's been a project to say the least. Just It's like an onion. When you buy an old house, you just keep peeling back the layers and it's just like, <laughs> how far do we want to go? Uh, I told the Lord, we were getting toward the end of our remodel, and I just told the Lord, I said, Lord, I would like to sell this before Thanksgiving <laughs> just to get it off my plate. I don't want to have to think about this property. I don't want to have to. You know what, Lord? It would be really nice if we could sell this for what we're asking. Because usually if you've ever bought a piece of property, you know how it works. You know, you, you put off what you want, and then they make a lower offer, and then somehow there's a secondary offer, and you somehow compromise and meet in the middle, and then that's it. I said, Lord, man, for me to really come out on this, I'm going to need a full price offer. Thanksgiving came. I ate my turkey and spent time with my family and went to bed that night. Here's how much God loves us. And he hears your prayer, and he hears the desire of your heart. He knows he's, he's got it all, man. It's all written down. He's got it all right there. Friday morning, my realtor calls me. She says, hey, uh, I wasn't working yesterday, obviously, because of the holiday, but we had an offer come in yesterday for full price on your house. And to God be the glory. But I'm telling you that just to tell you this, that you know what? I wasn't fasting and praying. I wasn't beating down the walls and, and oh, God, oh, God, you got to sell this house. It was not weeping and gnashing of teeth. It was just, Lord, you know. You know what my family needs. You know what we need. You know why. You know the connections I've built over the course of this project and all the things. Lord, you know. And so the Lord does know. And I want to encourage somebody here this morning. The Lord knows where you are. He knows what it is that you need. Thank God he knows what we need. And somehow he looks past what we want and he says, no, but this is what you need. And like a good parent, he gives us what we need. God has something for somebody here today. And the Holy Ghost is in this room. And there's something that's about to transpire. And I just, I'm, I've, I've prayed, I've done what I know I need to do. And so the rest is up to him. And the rest is up to the Lord to do what it is that he wants to do. All right. We're going to go to the word of the Lord at this time. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. Our kids can be dismissed. Brother Jonathan is going to be facilitating our kids' church in the back. I give honor to all of you who are here today. I know sometimes we enter into the Christmas season and there's just a lot of traveling. There's a lot of different things that happens during this time of season. And I'm just encouraged by you being here. And I want to encourage you to continue to be faithful to the house of God during the Christmas season. If it's possible for you to be here, please make it a point to be here. I, I pray, and my prayer is that every time you're here, you feel encouraged, you feel uplifted, you feel strengthened, um, and and you should, as you should, when you come to church, you should feel that. And I, our worship team just stepped out, but what a great job they did today, and I thank them for all their hard work. Well, I'm going to read two verses of scripture because I couldn't really. Marry myself to one. We're going to go to Old Testament and a little New Testament. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. It'll be on the screen behind me. And then also Matthew chapter 17. Zechariah 4 and 6. 
Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. I want to jump over to Matthew 17. Matthew 17 and 20, this is Jesus, and he said unto them, because of your unbelief, you know, he's telling them all these things that are not going to happen because of your unbelief. And then he says, but for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. So all you got to do is just truly just believe what it is that you're asking God for. You shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. There are things that transpire, and I can't explain them. I can't give you the how it is possible that God does what he does. The only thing that I can do today is point you to who makes it all possible. And I want to point you to Jesus Christ this morning. I feel like it is my my divine assignment today to point you to Jesus and and I feel if some of you can get your eye off of your situation and get your eyes on Jesus everything's going to work itself out let's pray right now before we're seated Lord you know where we are you know what it is that we've come in here with Lord there's there's so much stuff Lord there every one of us have something that we're dealing with here this morning every one of us have something in our family we have something in our body we have something of some kind we have brought our things But, Lord, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And, Lord, we commit these things to you today. And I ask, Lord, that your spirit would be in this place and it would help us, transform us, and guide us, Lord, as we move from this place. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. We speak our own language in the church. I'm not talking about just speaking with other tongues. I'm talking about we just got our own little internal ling- lingual, if you will. It's, a, it's an internal terminology that we use in the church. The world doesn't understand it. There are things that we say that we know exactly what we mean. There are a little counterintuitive, these things that we say, They're counterintuitive to people who have not walked this way and are outside of the church this morning. There there are statements of contrast in God's kingdom that are striking. They are unusual, unusual, but they are also remarkable uh, because they, they make sense to us. We understand it, but if you take it at its face value, those statements don't seem to make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense to say some of the things that we say. We say that a child of God must, be, must abase themselves in humility and become poor in spirit. We all Have you ever heard that? you got to become poor in spirit in order to gain Christ. But once we are born again, then we are considered rich. You can visit the most remote village in a third world nation anywhere on the planet. And if you find a man living there in a hut with only rags to cover his body, the world would condemn him as being amongst the most impoverished. But if he has been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and he's been filled with the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit, we would say that that man has a treasure. That doesn't make much sense to the world at large. That man with his hut and his rags will never be pictured on Forbes magazine. He'll never be listed in in the Fortune 500. But that man, if he has a treasure in an earthen vessel, is richer than anyone who has investments on Wall Street. He's more wealthy than anyone who has multiple property all across this globe. We consider him to have what we we call a treasure. We say things like this, I have joy in sorrow. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense from a natural worldview. There, there's no reasonable explanation for that. How can you claim to have joy when the tears 
are running down your face? How can someone enjoy, endure the heartache that life inevitably brings our way when everything falls apart in your life and you can't, yeah, how is it whenever you're hurting so bad that you can still say that I have joy? There's people in this room this morning, I know your situations and I know your circumstances and I know you are hurting today. I know there is pain in your heart. There's, there's grief that is there and it is real. But how is it that we can say we still have joy? How can you lose all week long and come crawling into the house of God on a Sunday morning singing, it is joy unspeakable and full of glory? How is that possible? How? I can't catalog it for you. I can't define it exactly or explain it. But I'll tell you that it is something that comes from a well that springs up from in, inside of every born-again believer. With joy, we draw from the wells of salvation. With, with joy, we look into what it is that God has done and what God has promised. And it's from that we draw our joy with joy, we draw waters out of those wells of salvation. I may not be able to explain it, but I am sure enough as I'm standing here today, I can tell you this morning that it is real. It is real, this thing called joy. When you are in the midst of sorrow, when everything in your world is falling apart, the joy of God is real, and it's available for whosoever wants it. We say that there is peace in the storm. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you say such a thing? It doesn't make any sense to anyone outside of the church for sure. How can someone experience the storms of life with all of its crashing waves of despair and winds of chaos and, and the thundering echo of failure and the lightning of confusion and, and you stand alone. If you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. You stand alone in your living room and you're in the middle of your storm. And how is it possible standing there in the midst of everything that's going on in your life and you could just simply utter the words, peace, peace, God's wonderful peace coming down from the... Father above. And you're singing this song, and there's something that transpired. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You're, you're taking a moment to worship the Lord in the middle of your storm, and all of a sudden, something warm comes over you from above, and it settles your spirit, and it's of God. And I don't expect me to explain you the how. All I can preach to you is the who. It's Jesus Christ that brings that joy. It's Jesus Christ that brings brings that peace. I can't tell you how it happens. All I can tell you is who it is that brings it and makes it possible. The same one who walked on the water at Galilee is still the same one who steps into my living room in the middle of my storm and is there with me and doesn't leave me, nor does he forsake me. There is a peace that comes with him. I can't explain it, but it is real. Don't know how he does it, but I know who it is that does it. When the cares and the trials and the tragedy of life come bearing down on you, there is something beyond the scope of my might. There is something that is far beyond my power that comes into my situation and it calms my storm. It is called the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and it's available for whoever needs it today. It's for everyone. There may be no better explanation, or maybe I should even say an example of contrast than those words given by the Apostle Paul. Before we jump into the words of Paul, let's take a real quick collective IQ test. <laughs> Trust me, I'll make this as simple as possible. What is the opposite of big? Something cannot be both big and small at the same time. They are two opposing things. So what is the opposite of hot? Good. Man, you guys are passing with flying colors. This is great. We understand that something cannot be both hot and cold at the same time. 
If you have one, you cannot have the other. The two cannot coexist at the same time. They're contrary to one another. That's well, what's the opposite of short? Tall. We understand that it's either tall or it's short. It must be one or the other. It cannot be both at the same time. It is or it isn't. It's either tall or it's short. It's neither both at the same time. One more. What's the opposite of strong? It can be strong and also be, but wait a minute. Hang on. Before we get too far down the road on this one. Let's read about what Paul has to say about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 12 and 10, Wherefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I'm not strong after the trial is over. I'm not strong when the weakness passes. I'm not strong after God fixes my dilemma. I'm not strong because I feel like I'm strong. But the scripture says that when I am weak, then am I strong. What does that mean, preacher? It means this. It does that because think about it. It doesn't make any sense. How could one be both weak and strong at the same time? They are complete opposites. And I suppose it would be impossible for a man or a woman who's never been born again to understand this. But for those who have been born of the water and have been born of the Spirit, when I have Christ in me, the hope of glory, when I have the Holy Ghost in me, when I have eternity in me, I have a source of strength that never wavers. Oh, somebody needs to preach with the preacher this morning. I have a source of strength that has never had a day off. It doesn't take days off. It doesn't go by the way it feels. It is what it is. It's forever settled. It's in heaven. It's eternal. It's called the spirit of Jesus Christ. And when I have it in me, it doesn't matter how I feel. It is who he is. I have a source of strength that has never lost a battle. We need to hear, you need to hear me this morning. He's just as strong on my best day as he is on my worst day. He's just as strong. Uh, it, his strength never wavers. It never fails. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's a reason why the Bible calls it that way. It just says it like it is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what does that mean? It means regardless of how I feel, I'm still strong because he's still with me. Regardless of how I feel, I'm not afraid because he'll never leave me nor will he forsake me. His strength has nothing to do with how you feel. Boy, it got quiet in here. I'm going to take a drink. His strength has nothing to do with how you feel. Some of us need to really hear that right there. Your feelings don't matter when it comes to the strength of the God you serve. Oh, man. It's like I just hit a wall. I feel it in the Holy Ghost. Just because you're feeling low doesn't change the fact that he's still high and lifted up. Just because you may feel like you're at a low point in your life doesn't, does not mean at all that God has somehow diminished in his ability. My strength is in God is not determined by what I'm going through. It's determined by who lives inside of me. I'll say it again. My strength in God is not determined by what I'm going through. It is determined by who it is that lives with inside of me. It's not determined by my circumstances. It's determined by my infilling. Somebody needs to grab a hold of this this morning. I'm trying to pull somebody up today. When I am weak, I'm just as strong as I was when I feel strong. You didn't hear that. Uh, when I'm strong, I'm no stronger than I am whenever I feel like I'm weak. How I feel doesn't change the power of Christ that lives inside of me. 
It does not change. I'm trying to help somebody today that's going through a hard season right now. You're in a hard place, and you're here today. You're, you're barely here today. You've, you've gotten yourself together. You've pulled it together just to be present today, and I thank you for doing that. But hear the word of the Lord. The Lord knows where you are, and he knows what it is. It's a hard season for you, but you need to hear this word for you this morning. God's strength is not based on how you feel. His strength is based on the fact of what his word declares that he is. The devil's been trying to convince you that you're not going to make it. I've got some good news for you. You have a source of strength that even when you're weak, you're still strong. When I'm weak in feeling, I'm strong in faith. When I'm weak in ideas, I'm still strong in direction. When I'm weak in my flesh, I'm still strong in my spirit. When I'm weak in my ability, I'm still strong in his anointing. I want to take you through a season in Israel's history for just a minute. I want to go to the book of 2 Samuel and and kind of camp out there just for a minute and tell you a story about David. For years there has been an ongoing war between the house of David and the house of Saul. Saul is dead, and now David is positioning and kind of transitioning from different areas, moving into what it is that God had promised him. Saul has died, and they ended up anointing two individuals to be king. We have David who is anointed king over the nation of Judah, which is the southern part of Israel. And then we have the ten tribes to the north, which they just call Israel. And Ishbaleth is the son of Saul. We had Jonathan who died in battle with his father, but then we also have Ishbaleth. And he had a general whose name was Abner. David has a general whose name is Joab. These two generals get together, Abner Abner and Joab get together and they're like, hey, let's talk this out. This little, we, we keep on having these conflicts. Let's, let's get together and see if we can make a peace accord. They get together. A skirmish breaks out. Fighting breaks out amongst their two groups that were there that day. And Ab Abner, through the course of him trying to be protective of Joab's brother, ends up killing Joab's brother. He didn't want to, but it's almost like he had to. It was either him or Joab's brother. Joab does not forget that. And if you know anything about Joab, if you, if you want to do a character study, study the life of Joab, he's a bloody man who deserves everything that God gave him. And you'll see how that works out in the end. But we have two generals. We have Abner now and we have Joab. Ishbaleth, the king of the north. We have David, the king in the south. And Ishbaleth gets sideways with Abner. Abner ends up falling in love with a woman that Ishbaleth thinks that he doesn't have any right to, and, and Ishbaleth doesn't, like, uh, doesn't like the fact that Abner's, Abner's interested in this woman, and Abner doesn't like the fact that Ishbaleth isn't going to give his blessing. And so Ishbaleth says, you know what? I'm the one that promoted you to be king over the northern tribes anyway. He said, I'm done here. And so Abner goes down south to David's camp, and he says, David, I, I, I no longer want to be under the, the reign and the rule of Ishbaleth. I want to bring the army to you, and I'll bring Ishbaleth's crown. We'll push him aside. You will be the king over all the nation of Israel. Both Judah and Israel, will. it will be one. We will be one nation again. And David, if you can imagine, wants this more than anything. He's thinking in his mind that this has finally come to pass, that finally what Samuel the prophet had anointed me for will come to pass. And he agrees with Abner about this deal that we're going to bring the kingdoms together finally. He sends Abner away in peace, and Abner's on his way back up north to Hebron. And while he's on his way, here comes a group of men led by no other than Joab. And Joab says, hey, I heard you guys are making a peace deal. We're going to get this thing together. He said, I would like to just talk to you a little bit about that, Abner. Why don't you come over here and meet me in the gate? You and I will just talk one-on-one, -on -one, mano y mano. Abner, thinking that all is well, 
goes to the gate with Joab. And Joab takes a knife and stabs Abner and kills him. David hears about this. Think about it. The peace that was possible was destroyed by Joab that day because Joab had an axe to grind and he destroyed the potential for peace. And David is, he is, he's beside himself. He is, he's grieving. He doesn't know, he is just, he's bewailing the fact that now Abner is dead. In fact, he calls all the nation of Judah to, to wail and to grieve and to lament and to go into this grieving process over the death of Abner. And Abner, they literally are following Abner, and they're, they're, they're burying Abner. And after Abner is bar- buried, and David says this thing in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 39, he says, I am weak this day, though anointed king. David is saying, if I'm the king, why is it that I feel so weak? David couldn't figure out in his identity as king, why did he feel so weak and powerless? He's discouraged. His head is down. He he doesn't know how things are going to work out. He says, I'm a king, but I don't understand why I feel so weak. Why do I feel so vulnerable? If I was there that day, if there's something I could say to David, I would say this. David, you're trying to figure out as a king why you feel so weak. But I want to encourage you, David, you may feel weak, but you're still a king. Somebody missed that right there. You have to understand, he's trying to figure out as a king, why does he feel weak? But he needs to understand, although you may feel weak, you need to know that you're still a king. It's who you are. It's your identity that matters. You're still a king. David, you're focused on your feelings. I want you to focus on your identity. You're trying to figure out why you feel the way that you feel. And when you have this identity, you need to see that regardless of how you feel, you still have an identity. You still have this authority, this anointing that is upon you. Don't forget about that. Come on, somebody. You may feel weak, but you're still anointed. You may, feel, you may feel like you're low in your spirit, but you're still anointed of God. You're still a child of God. You're still a child of God. You're still a son of the king of glory. You may feel weak, but you're still a champion. You may feel weak, but you're still a victor in Jesus Christ. Oh, man, I wonder if somebody could confuse hell right now by worshiping him because hell doesn't expect you to do that because he knows where you are and he knows what you're going through. Your identity is a blood-bought, born-again, sanctified worshiper of the Most High. That's who you are. I'm just trying to help someone this morning understand that it's not about how you feel. It's about your identity. And that you're a child of God no matter how you feel. You're saying, well, if I'm a Christian, why do I have days like this? Because you're not in heaven yet. And as long as you're here, you're going to have some tough days. But the good news is that even on the tough days, you're still a child of God. On your tough days, the devil is still under your feet. We sang that song, He's Under My Feet. Get all excited about that. Why? Because that's where he belongs. He he belongs under your feet. On your tough days, you're still anointed of the Holy Ghost. You need to stop defining yourself by what's going on around you, but who it is that's moved inside of you, what it is that's moving inside of you. I'm talking about the power of the Spirit. You need to tap into that thing that is inside of you whenever you're going through the going through, whenever life gets tough. Can I just tell you something? The devil invented it. He invented identity theft. Identity theft has become a big problem in our world today. The Federal Trade Commission says that millions of people every year had their identity stolen. I'm sure many of us have had a credit card compromised or whatever. 
you know, you've gotten those phone calls. Your your identity has possibly been blah, 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 you know, all this. You know, we've all kind of shared in that. Identity theft has been around a long time, but it's been around a lot longer than you think because it actually started in heaven. Isaiah 14 and 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend unto the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. The devil got his start trying to steal an identity that was not his, and he's still in the business of trying to steal identity, even today. He still does it. Not, not, but here's a little different twist on it, though. Not, only now he doesn't steal your identity so that he could use it. He steals your identity so that you won't use it. Listen to me. If the devil can rob you of an awareness of who you are, Oh, man. If he can rob you of an awareness of who you really are, you'll let him push you around. You'll let him beat you up. You'll let him assault your family. But if you understand who you are, you'll plant your feet and declare to him that it doesn't matter how I feel. Satan, you belong under my feet. Get your hands off my marriage. Get your hands off my kids. Get your hands off my family. You'll take an authority position over him every single day if you'll know who it is that you are. I can hear it in my spirit, someone saying, I don't feel like I can do that. It doesn't matter how you feel. It has everything to do with who you really are. You need to know who you are today. You're a blood-washed, Holy Ghost-filled, apostolic saint of God, and his power resides in you. Now use it. Use it. Activate the Holy Ghost that is within you. Rise up in your identity and put the devil in his place where he belongs. You've been going through the going through. Then get up, child of God, and do what it is that you've been called to do. Put the devil in his place. Your kids have been walking away from God far too long. Put the devil in his place. Take authority and dominion over those things that you know you have a right to do. Any Holy Ghost-filled child of God is the hottest spiritual thing on the planet. There's not a devil in hell that wants to mess with you if you're full of the Holy Ghost. Amen? This last Halloween, I saw a, a poll that was being asked of people what the scariest movie that they ever have, had seen was. The scariest movie that received the most votes was... The Exorcist. And I pray that nobody entertains the idea of watching that filth because if you do, you deserve everything that comes into your home. We don't, we don't mess with that stuff. You don't, need to, you don't need to watch that filth and that garbage to understand what evil is. You need to get yourself in the Word of God. You, you'll know evil when it shows up because you'll be so refreshed and renewed in the Spirit. And, by the way, you'll also be empowered to do something with it and about it. So this poll suggested that the thing that terrifies people the most is the devil. Do you know that they play, you know what they play in hell whenever they want to get scared? Church. If a demon wants to get scared, all they have to do is put a clip on of one of you getting up out of your pew in the middle of your trial. And stepping out in faith, believing that God can and that he will, it scares hell half to death. Because you, in the middle of your trial, realize that you're still a child of God. Oh, you need to hear me this morning. I, I can still worship. I can still pray. I can still be faithful. I can still celebrate Jesus. Even though I'm going through some things, I can still celebrate him today. That's what skills, scares hell the most. And when one child of God put their feelings aside and declares their identity in Christ, 
It's not how I feel, but it's who he is. David, it doesn't matter how you feel. Reach up on top of your head and you'll feel something. That's called a crown. You need to remember you're still anointed king, regardless of how you feel. Yeah, you're weak. I know you're in a tough spot, David, but you need to understand you're still anointed the king of Israel. I'm going to close with this, Luke chapter 10, verse 19. You can stand with me if you would. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. We've heard that scripture Many of you know what that scripture means. You have been given authority over all the power of the enemy. By the word of God, you have been given that. So wherever you are today, whatever it is you've been battling, whatever it is you've been facing, you have been given the authority according to the word of God to take dominion over all the power of the enemy in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your finances, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, wherever the power of the enemy is, wherever it is, it doesn't matter what kind it is, it doesn't matter where you may confront it, all the power of the enemy is subject to the power that resides inside of you. I heard someone once say that, I want to read that again, man. He's just... Yeah. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I heard someone say it this way one time. That serpents strike with their heads. Scorpions strike with their tails. So heads or tails, we win. I had a conversation with someone the other day. They were talking about how Satan is getting stronger, and and I was the more they talked, the more confused I was. They were pointing out the fact that in the Old Testament he shows up as a serpent. And by the time we get into the New Testament, he's a lion. By the time Paul gets done talking about him, and we get to John's account of him in the Book of Revelation, he's now a dragon. Just exponentially getting larger, getting more powerful. I had to remind him that in Psalms 91, verse 13, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. The adder is a snake, by the way. The young, lag, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. In other words, you still have the power and the authority through the power of his spirit that works inside of you to put the no matter how big he may have seen recently in your life to put him under your feet where he belongs. It doesn't matter how big the enemy seems to be in your life lately. Because of your identity, you still have the authority to put him where he needs to be. And so I'm trying hard to convince some of you that you're more, that, that you're more than how you feel. You're more than how you feel. You're more than what it is your circumstance says that you are. You're a child of God. You're who the Word of God says that you are. You're the head and not the tail. You're more than a conqueror. Your spiritual identity says that you can, you can do more than what you feel. You are more because of Him. And so this morning I want to open up this altar for whosoever will. I want to open up this altar for whosoever will because this altar is open for anyone who needs to exercise their God-given right this morning. For some of you, you've been struggling all week long. For some of you, you've had a tough week. For some of you, it's been a tough day. And this morning, you just need to exercise a little bit. And just remind the devil, Lord, Lord, it's on my side. doesn't matter what you threw at me. 
I seen what you did with my kids. I seen what you did with my family. I seen what you're trying to do with my house. I seen what you're trying to do, but that doesn't matter. I've got one who is inside of me, and the Word of God declares it to me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I've got more power than you do, devil. I've got more strength than you do, Satan. You need to understand who I am. I belong to the King of glory. And so this morning, I wonder if we could just celebrate the fact that our identity is in him. It's not in how I feel. Come on, we're going to worship the Lord, and we're just going to take our liberty right now to worship him and declare some things in the Holy Ghost. You need to exercise your right as a believer this morning. my enemies, it's your body and the blood you shed for me, because this is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight. There's a table you prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. It's your body and the blood you shed for me. This is how I fight my battles. Because this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I Fuck. 